All right, so we will begin our class, and we are in lesson four in Unraveling Evolution. It's on page 38. And as I have said, we are doing lessons four and five, mostly four today. We'll jump into five just a little. But then after tonight's class, we're done with this book. Y'all remember what we're doing next? The ultimate proof of creation. We're going to spend the rest of the quarter on that subject. So we'll actually start that on Wednesday night, I mean on the Sunday, which is a video lesson. I almost hate that. I kind of wish we were here together to, to start it, but that's the way the calendar fell. So we will plan to start that, Lord willing, on Sunday. So we'll have four more classes, Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday, Wednesday. And that'll wrap up our study on this great subject where we're studying God's word and what God has to say about his creation. What he did, how he did it, why he did it, and what that means to us. All right, so we are studying tonight theistic evolution. And if you can think about the word theistic, you can probably figure out what theistic evolution is. Creation, or creationism, if you will, attributes the universe uh, to the power of God. Whereas evolution is atheistic. So creation is a theistic view. Theism meaning a God. So creation is theistic, whereas evolution is atheistic. And that says, that theory is that everything results from chance. Everything is driven by itself, has its own power and has its own direction. Well, some people who are not satisfied with evolution um, or some creationists who are not satisfied with the taking the Bible just as it is, have tried, tried to uh, combine the two. And uh, Brother Gertler, in, this, in his book, well, I've got, it, I've got it typed out here, so we don't have to turn to it on page 38. He describes it this way, theistic evolution is a compromising position whereby one does not embrace a naturalistic, that is an atheistic or humanistic evolutionary belief but at the same time rejects a literal interpretation of the creation week recorded in the first two chapters of Genesis. So it's trying to uh, accept the two and bring the two together and combine them into one. According to theisticevolution.org, and there is a, a website dedicated to this belief, they describe it this way, the theistic evolution does not consider the, the existence this existence, that is, every, everything in the universe. Theistic evolution does not consider this existence to be by random chance. Instead, the view is that God used evolution to create. In other words, they say, well, yes, God did create, but how he did it was by using evolution. So they cannot get around the, the fact that evolution has no answer for the origin of life. That's one thing we haven't talked about much in this class. I, looking back, I wish we had, I had spent more time on that. The origin of life, where did life come from? They cannot account for that first life. You know, they talk about after life was on the earth, how it evolved into something else, but they cannot bring life from non-life. So some people know that there's no uh, that they have no hope of figuring out where life came from without God. So they say, okay, after God created life in the beginning, then he used evolution to bring about all the change that is on the earth and in the universe. Turn uh, in your book to page 38. Like I said, we're going to read in the book a little bit more than usual. If you look on... Page 38 on the right column, right about the middle, over on the right side of that column, um, it starts, those who walk, this fine 
You see that? Those who walk. Okay, that's where we begin. 38 in the middle of the page. Those who walk this fine line of faith do so in order to retain allegiance to God while attempting to remain popular with the humanistic scientific community. The entertainment industry, mass media, and even public schools and universities have made popular the myth that all credible, credible science, scientists and scholars accept evolution as fact. Thus, many believers have been coerced into thinking that they too must accept some form of this false teaching in order to be considered scientifically and socially relevant. In other words, we're ostracized if we believe in creation as revealed in the Bible. So they're believers to an extent, but they want to be accepted by those in the evolutionary community. So, either, there's two choices, either they actually believe the evidence presented by evolutionary scientists and attempt to insert geologic time into the biblical text. Can you follow on there? Theistic evolutions fall, fall, fall into two categories. Either they actually believe the evidence presented by evolutionary scientists and then attempt to stick it into the Bible somehow. Here's a, a quote along that line. It is hardly conceivable that anyone would question the interpretation of these, that is, the six days of creation, as ordinary days, were it not for the fact that people are attempting to reconcile Genesis and evolution. Okay? And that's the truth. Why would anybody read about the six days of creation and find anything other than six days of creation? Six literal solar days if they're not trying to reconcile or combine it with evolution. Because faulty science takes precedent, precedence over the Word of God. Remember when we talked about scientists being surprised at their discoveries? Scientists are so often stunned by what, they're, what is revealed in their studies and in the lab because they are men, they are faulty, they are learning. Nothing wrong with that. The fault is for them to purport that they know it all, that they have all the answers, because they are faulty men and they have to revamp and change their theories from time to time. The Bible was written long before the debate began and it has not had to change. Okay, that is one option. A, they, they believe in evolution, but they want to add the Bible to it or add it into the Bible somehow. Or, they want to compromise so as to be accepted by evolutionists while maintaining their belief in God. I think that's perhaps the more likely scenario. They want to be accepted by both sides. They want to compromise the two. Is there such a thing as a compromise when it comes to God's Word and what He says about creation? This is what Jesus said about compromise. In Matthew 15, Then His disciples came to Him and said, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? So Jesus said to them, Oh, I didn't know I offended anybody. Tell them to come back and I will change my tone, I will change my tune, and I won't, I'll try not to offend anybody, and I'll compromise with them. Is that what Jesus said? No. Jesus said, Every plant which my Father, my Heavenly Father, has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into the ditch. No room for compromise. Either you follow the truth, or you follow blind leaders, and you'll fall into the ditch along with them. Jesus said, He who is not with me, I will compromise with him. No. He said, He who is not with me is against me. One or the other. No compromise allowed. 
He who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Jesus never changed his message to avoid offending anybody. You accept his word as he preached it, as he taught it, or you go your way. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Humble yourself. Don't be so arrogant that you want Jesus to change his ways or his word to fit your ideas. No, we need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt us in due time. All right, on page 39 in the book. Uh, right around the middle of the page, on the left side of that column, the first column, uh, what we must never forget. You see that? On page 39, about the middle of the page. What we must never forget as Christians is that regardless of what the so-called scientists, experts, and authorities avow, God's Word is still the final and sole authority regarding our origin. Scientific theories are in a constant state of flux, undergoing modification, and even frequently disproved and discarded. God's Word never changes. God's Word should never be modified. And God's Word can never be disproven. You cannot always rely on secular science. You can always rely upon the Word of God. Remember, I've said this several times, I've said it already once in this class. If you learn nothing else from this class, then you aren't listening. But if you learn nothing else from this class, learn this. The Bible did not record the, the accounts of creation after people discovered them. The Bible recorded the accounts of creation and the flood long before people started studying and researching and even looking into origins and digging up fossils and studying science. The account of creation and the flood were not dreamed up as a response to the theory of atheistic evolution. In other words, people didn't come up with a theory of evolution and the Bible was written to try to answer that. No, the Bible was written long before anybody ever heard of evolution. The descriptions of these events, in, as recorded in the Bible, of creation and the flood, have stood the test of time and relentless scrutiny. Relentless scrutiny over the last 150 years especially. God's Word has never changed, and it doesn't need to be changed. The Bible was not written in an attempt to account for new scientific discoveries like the new theories that they come out with or the altering. As this, this paragraph said, scientific theories are in a constant state of flux. That is, they're changing, undergoing modification. They are even disproven. They are discarded sometimes. Because, why? Because they're, they're men. They're faulty men, like we are. I mean, we're, I'm not putting them down. I'm putting them down if they decide that they reject God's Word because God's Word is infallible and it's true. And it never changes and does not need to be changed. All right, look at the bottom of that page. On 39, right column. Uh, I'm sorry, 39, not at the bottom, right at the middle of the page, uh, beginning with although, although the Genesis account. Right, column 39. Although the Genesis account clearly teaches what we might call a creation week, because of secular teaching, many compromising Bible students are willing to discard the little truth of the first and second chapters in the Bible in order to be in agreement with sci secular scientific dogma. They are willing to compromise with both ideas, thus to gain the favor of both sides. In other words, they, they want to be accepted by the creationists. Yes, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm, I, I went to the church all my life, maybe. So, so I don't want to be ostracized by them. But then I go to college, and everybody believes in evolution. All my teachers are 
pouring it down my throat. So I want to be accepted by them also. So that way I can gain the favor of both sides. I can compromise. But the irony is that they are criticized and ridiculed by both sides. They're trying to be a moderate. Jesus said, as I said, you know, you're either with me or you're against me. I want you to be either cold or hot. But since you are lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. He said, I want you to be cold or hot. I'd rather you be cold than try to be lukewarm and try to compromise. At least I know what side you're on. Pick a side, <laughs> you might say. I remember riding in a boat with a friend one time, and a guy was heading toward him from several hundred yards away. I mean, right, right toward us. And he said, declare yourself. I mean, he couldn't hear him, of course. He was a long way away. But what he meant was, decide which way you're going. Don't try to split the middle. I so said, that's, that's what Jesus said. Declare yourself. One way or the other, don't try to have it both ways. Consider what one Darwinist professor has to say about the theory of theistic evolution. Okay, remember, he's a Darwinist professor, so he is dogmatically against creation. But here's what he says about those who try to compromise and combine the two. Here is what his assessment of theistic evolution. For millions of years, such impossible, pointless monstrosities as dinosaurs were the highest type of life on Earth. That method of creation would do discredit to the most brainless idiot who ever lived. It is a madman's method of creation, if it is a method at all. An intelligent being, that is God, set out to involve a man, or if an intelligent being set out to evolve a man, he would not spend millions of years evolving grotesque mistakes, animals, without a chance to escape extinction. Now, I'm not bringing up this quote because I believe this man, or because he is, like I said, an evolutionist. He's against the truth, against God's will. But I'm just pointing out that he, those on that side, don't accept theistic evolutions. So, they, their effort to be accepted by both sides results in them being not accepted by either side. Now at the bottom of page 39, this is by a, a so-called Bible expert at the Moody Bible Institute. He says this, that is the literal uh, creation, six-day creation as revealed in Genesis. It seems to run counter to modern scientific research, which, which indicates that the planet Earth was created several billion years ago. So in other words, he is accepting faulty science over God's clear word. This scientific research, remember, is conducted by atheistic evolutionists who start with the a priori assumption or belief in evolution. Have you ever heard that? Um, a priori meaning before you even do the study. They believed in the theory before they did the, the study and found the evidence. What do they do when the results of their experiments indicate intelligent design or indicate a young earth or indicate a worldwide flood? What do they do with those facts? They reject them in favor of what they believe already, which is evolution. Because theistic evolutionists put more faith in fallible scientists, that is men, than they do in the inspired, never changing, holy, inspired and revealed word of God. For all flesh is as grass and the glory of man is the flower of grass, the grass withereth the flower of the, thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. 1 Peter 1. Psalm 119, verse 38, forever. I'm sorry, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The ESV said it is firmly fixed. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in heaven. 
Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, Jesus said, shall not pass away. Da, 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 Trumpet fanfare, creatures that defy evolution. Ah, like I said, they'll come along at any time. You never know when they'll pop up. But I'll give you a hint, this is the last one. Because we're about to get into ultimate proof of creation. So, we want to end on a good note with our creatures that defy evolutionary explanation. We're going to talk about honeybee communication. How honeybees talk to each other, or at least communicate with each other. Now, you may have heard how dogs communicate, right? They're barking at each other. Well, are, what are they indicating? Are they saying, are they communicating with each other? Or are they just getting an idea across? Are they t telling, some, uh, telling the other dog something specific? No, they're just making noise. But honeybees actually communicate truth or facts or specific things to each other. This is fascinating. Okay, so when a bee is going out looking for nectar. It finds it and it comes back to the hive to tell the others. And the way it does it is by a waggle dance. Now this is not something that creationists invented. This is something that is scientifically proven. And if you put in honeybee waggle dance on YouTube, you'll get tons of hits. I mean, they have videos. We're about to look at one of them in a minute. If my uh, computer works right. So they communicate the locations of these flowers by a dance called the waggle dance. So what they do, they fly into the hive and they say, hey, I found some nectar. First of all, they'll give a taste of the nectar to the, to the bees around them. Okay, I see what you got there. Where'd you find it? Well, he does his waggle dance to show them how far it is away. He tells them actually how far the, <laughs> the flowers are away from the hive. Not only that, he tells them the direction from the hive in relation to the sun. Well, remember when he went out and got the, flower, uh, the nectar, he came maybe as a mile away. When he came back, it took several minutes. Well, the sun has moved a little bit. Actually, the earth has moved a little bit. So, the sun's movement is now at a different place than it was when he first found it. And of course, after he communicates and they go back, if they went to the same place in relation to the sun, they wouldn't find it. So, when he does his waggle dance, he actually compensates for the movement of the sun. They have found this to be fact. This is uh, just inside a hive. It just looks like a uh, crazy jumble of activity, but there's actually communication going on here, which we'll look at in a minute. All right, see if I can narrate this. All right, there is a bee. This is a, a scientist, you know, putting uh, a fake flower up there, you might say, so they put bait there. The bee finds it, and he flies back to the hive. And then slowly, one by one, not all at once, one by one, more bees come to the hive, even though it was far away from the hive. How did they find it? Well, they tested it by putting two sources of food at different angles from the hive. They painted a little spot on some of them red, and on others they painted it green. And they flew back, and the ones that were painted green, they did their waggle dance in that direction. The ones that were red did their waggle dance in that direction. And that was telling the other bees, this is the direction you go. And not only the direction you go, but he's telling them how far to go. And that's where you'll find this nectar. So here is the guy, he's talking right here. 
That one right there. Do you see him do his waggle dance? So, what he does is he'll, he'll do a, depending on which direction it is, he'll go, I, 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 and then he'll come around this way. And then he'll do his waggle, and then he'll come around this way. Waggle, come around this way. So he's doing it in a figure eight with a waggle in between. And this waggle tells him, tells the other bees how far it is away and what direction it is. How did they figure this out? How do they communicate this? How do they know that the other is communicating this? Evolutionists have no explanation for this. This de defies evolutionary explanation. The little bees can communicate with each other to a, to a, a very specific spot and tell each other this is where it is. And they're thinking, I don't know if they've proven this yet, but they're trying to uh, do experiments to find out, maybe they're even telling how far, I mean, what kind of nectar it is and how much is there. They think that they may give off pheromones that is a, a, um, a scent that tells them uh, the other bees how far it is away. So this is just fascinating what God has created. And evolution can't explain it, but we can. God has explained it when he said, I made the creeping things. And behold, it was very good. All right, so in our study of theistic evolution, we want to talk about one particular theory primarily, because it is probably the most popular of the theories. There is the gap theory of theistic evolution, which gained a little popularity, but not a tremendous amount. It's, it just says, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Before Genesis 1-2, 13 billion years occurred. There's a gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 of 13 billion years. And the, the earth was without form and void in verse 2. That's a gap. But that one has not gained wide acceptance. But the day-age the day age theory has gained more acceptance. So that's the one we want to spend most of our time talking about. Day age. So it, what, it, what it says is that each of the days of creation as described in Genesis 1 was an age that is composed of thousands or millions or even billions of years. So it's a day that represents an age. And so, of course, what does this do? Does it, this gives them time to fit in what they believe are the eons of time that they need to fit in evolution, the, the geologic and uh, fossil records and the billions of years. But the, the day-age theory cannot be compromised with the Bible. It's not in the Bible and therefore it must be rejected. And I'm going to give you 11 reasons why the day-age theory must be rejected. I'm going to kind of go through this fast. Put your thinking cap on because this is going to answer the day-age theory. And I'm going into detail because I don't want to leave you without um, a firm refutation of the day-age theory. Eleven reasons. Let's look at them. Verse, uh, number one, Genesis 1-2, one, or 1 through 2, one, chapters 1 and 2, says that God created the world in six days. First of all, that should answer the whole thing. It should be over. Let me tell you a little bit about how to interpret the Bible. Okay? First of all, in fact, this is not how you interpret the Bible. This is how you interpret language or anything that you read. And that is, you should always take the usual, normal meaning of a word unless the context demands a figurative interpretation. That's true of anything, not just the Bible. Uh, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7 for some examples of this. Okay? You should always take the usual, normal meaning 
unless the context demands a figurative interpretation. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 3, or we'll just read verse 3. Why do you behold the speck that is in your brother's eye, but considers not the beam that is in your own eye, or the plank that is in your own eye? Was Jesus talking about you having a board, an actual board, wooden board sticking out of your eye? No. Well, how do we know that? The context makes it clear. The context demands. When he says plank, he's talking about figuratively. Verse 6. Give not that which is holy to the dogs, neither cast your pearls before swine. All right, was he talking about literal dogs? Don't give what's holy to the dogs. Uh, don't cast your pearls with literal pearls before pigs, literal pigs. No, very clear. How is it clear? He didn't explain when I'm talking about swine. I don't mean literal pig. No, he didn't have to. The context makes it clear. The context demands a figurative um, interpretation. Uh, verse 7, Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. Knock, is that literal? Do we knock on a door to come to God? No. How do we know that? It is demanded uh, that it is figurative by the language. Uh, verse 15, beware of false teachers who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Are they real wolves? Are they uh, really in sheep's clothing? Uh, fleece? No. It is the context demands a figurative interpretation. So those who, who believe in the day-age theory must prove that the word day necessarily means millions of years. It's up to them to prove that. That it necessarily means millions of years. So therefore, does anything in the context demand uh, that interpretation. Context always makes everything clear. For instance, in my father's day, you could drive from coast to coast in five days if you only drove during the day. I've used the word day three times in that little sentence, and it means three different things. How do you know? In my father's day, is that a 24 hour day? No. In my father's era, or time that he lived. You could drive from coast to coast in five days. Is that a literal 24-hour day? Yes. How do you know that? Context tells us. If you only drove during the day, is that a 24-hour day? No. What does that mean? During the, during the light part of the day. Isn't it interesting how the context makes it clear exactly what the meaning of those, of those uses of the word day is? All right, number two. Remember, we're refuting uh, the day-age theory. Number two, the meaning of the Hebrew word yom. The Hebrew word yom that is translated day, it's, it's translated day almost 1,200 times, and it's translated time 65 times. And it's obvious from the context that it should be translated time, such as Genesis 4, 3, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. So that would not be a 24-hour day, but the context made it clear. Also, the plural form of it, yamim, translated days about 700 times. So you have about 1,900 times um, that it's translated day or days, which is about 96% of the time. So the preponderance of the evidence is that you default to it meaning um, an actual 24-hour day. That's number two. Number three, the use of the word day preceded by a numerical qualifier. Okay? In, on page 42, one, by, one biblical scholar said he, he had found no uses of the word day preceded by a numerical qualifier, that is, third day, first day, second day, to mean anything other than a literal 24-hour day. Now, Brad said he did come up with one in the Bible, but then he also says, you know what, that might actually be literal, but we can't tell. 
But if so, it's only one. Um, so I'm going to throw that in out there just because I cannot say this with absolute certainty, but I believe that it most likely is true that if there is a numerical qualifier, meaning the seventh day, that the word day means a literal 24-hour uh, solar day. And if, if not, if, if God didn't mean literal days, what word should he have said? How, what, how would he have said it if he did mean literal days? He said exactly what he meant, and his language is very clear. Only a belief in faulty science is responsible for the idea that day means anything other than a 24-hour day, especially millions of years. Number four, day is clearly a cycle of light and dark. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the first day because God called the light day and the, the uh, darkness he called night. So he's talking about a literal 24-hour day. But here we have two uses of the word day, which are uh, different meanings. He called the light day, darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Those don't mean the same thing. One of them means the light part of the day. The other means a 24-hour day, which includes the night. Number five. Contextual markers, that is, contextual indicator. We're talking about context in this study. All right, so we talked about a number, that is a numerical qualifier, first, second, third day. <clears throat> evening, anytime the word evening is used, either with or without the word day, is talking about evening, that is, the evening part of a day. The word morning means a, a, a day, a morning as we think of it. Even with, whether it's used with or without the word day. But especially when it says evening and morning together in the same context. That it <coughs> always means a regular day. And also when it's night contrasted with day. So, let's apply these contextual clues to Genesis chapter 1. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening, remember that's our first one, our first contextual marker. And the morning, that's our second one, or the first numerical qualifier, day. So you've got evening, morning, number, day. Then in verse 8, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day. Pretty clear, isn't it? Kind of like God is saying, I mean a literal day here. In case you don't get it, I mean a literal day. And in case you're a little bit slow, I mean a regular day. And in case you're intellectually challenged, I mean a regular day. God has made it very clear that he's talking about a regular day. How would he have said it otherwise if he didn't mean a regular day? Number six. Days is used with seasons and years in Genesis 1, 14. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons for days and for years. So he said seasons and years. If a day means millions of years, how long is a season? If a day means millions of years, how long is a year? Let the days be for years. So he said days make up years. Number seven. When God created the sun, moon, and stars, he said they were to divide, divide the day from the night. Once again, if day means millions of years, what does night mean? Here's another one that just bl blows the theory out of the water. Moses, number eight, Moses based the Sabbath day on the days of creation. When he gave the 
the law for the Sabbath day in, in Exodus chapter 20. He said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath unto the Lord thy God. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed it the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So according to the theory, God was saying, do all your work in six days, be, and, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to, to the Lord because God created the heavens and the earth in billions of years, and he rested on the next billions of years. For this command to make any sense at all, the days must be the same. It must be the same length. You work for six days and rest on the seventh day because I work for six days and I rested on the seventh day. Nine. God created man from the beginning. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. That's what Jesus said in Mark 10. The theory states that man came at the very end of creation, several billion years after the beginning of the creation. All right, so here's what we have. From the beginning of creation, what Jesus said, God made them male and female. So let's look at the two possibilities. Here we have creation happening 4,000 years before Christ, which the Bible clearly says. And he says he created Adam and Eve from the beginning of the creation. According to the theory, 14 billion years happened before Adam and Eve came. So, when did Adam and Eve come? According to this one, at the beginning of creation or at the end of creation? Very obviously, Jesus said he created Adam and Eve at the beginning of creation. So the theory is wrong. Number 10, Adam was the first man. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. According to the theory, Adam was the son of his parents, but his parents were not human. They were almost human. They were almost evolved completely into humans, but they were still animals. But when the baby Adam was born, God said, okay, now this one's the first human. Who can believe it? Number 11, death was the penalty for sin. But they say that there are billions of fossils represent billions of dead animals. Animals that died before the first sin occurred. So if death, if death came before Adam sinned, then death is not the penalty for sin. Remember, God created the earth and said it was very good. Theistic evolution is wrong. But what about somebody who says, but most scientists don't believe in a six-day creation. Well, most scientists don't believe the, the parting of the Red Sea or in the virgin birth of Christ or that Jesus walked on the water, that he calmed the storm by speaking to it, that he healed the blind, and that he raised the dead. Who are we going to believe? The secular scientist says, the earth is billions of years old. Take my word for it. Or are we going to believe God, who said, I created everything in six days. Take my word for it. The end. We got through. So... With that, we're about to start. Somebody tell me, what are we going to start next uh, Sunday? Anybody? The ultimate proof of creation. All right, I'm excited about it. There's nothing really to study. Um, don't have a book to study or anything. Just be uh, ready. I'll try to get the first video posted over the weekend. May not be till uh, Sunday afternoon. Don't know exactly, but be watching for the email and uh, jump on that and follow that. Uh, <laughs> it's, like I said, it's going to be a little bit different way of thinking about some of these things. But we're going to get to the heart of the matter. Like I said, like I said before, we're, we can't just throw evidence at each other because we both have the same evidence. 
So we need to get at the heart of it and try to uh, show that their worldview is wrong. Uh, 